Welcome to America's Heroes Group. So welcome back to America's Heroes Group. This time with a round taper with our partner, Lieutenant Colonel Jennifer Ruth Green, founder and CEO of Battle Proven Leadership. Today is Saturday, September 23rd, 2023. September is National Suicide Prevention and Hispanic Heritage Month. Our host is Kev Kelly. I'm Sean Claiborne, the co-host. Our executive producer is Glenda Smith and our digital media producer is Ivan Ortega of Scouts Honor Productions. And of course, we have our partner, Jennifer Ruth Green, Lieutenant Colonel of the Indiana Air National Guard and graduate of the United States Air Force Academy, combat veteran of Iraqi freedom and founder and CEO of Battle Proven Leadership. How are you doing today? Good, Sean. Happy Saturday. September is exciting. Thank you so much for having me once again. It's an honor to be here. It's always a pleasure to have you. So you want to continue our discussion about leadership. And one of the things you mentioned um, as one of the talking points uh, is about relationships and how gaps diminish relationships. What do you mean by that? Yes. So just like in any relationship that you have with any person that you're close to, when there is a difference between what you say and what you do, people struggle. And so it's important to diminish that gap as often as possible. I heard this quote, and I really like it. It's not original with me, but it says, your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Mm -hmm. So what you say speaks, or excuse me, what you do speaks far louder than what you say. Mm -hmm. And so if those two things don't match, there's going to be great difficulty. And that's one of the things that we wanted to try to talk about and really hone in on by providing clear pathways for people to understand how they can make sure that the say do gap is non-existent in how they interact and engage with people. Why is it in your opinion easier to to say something versus do something? But if you if you're saying it, you, I'm assuming or I, or I would think that you believe it. And if you believe it, I would think that you would actually do it. So why is there a gap in the first place? Yeah, well, you know, I was thinking about that the other day, as a matter of fact, and I was thinking about kind of the transactional relationships as opposed to genuine relationships. And in transactional relationships, you have somebody who's expecting something or wants to have something as a result of that connection. And so in connecting with people, being genuine is so important. And so if you have somebody that's transactional, you can't really trust what they say. You can only watch what they do. And so in genuine relationships, if you're not motivated by anything other than serving someone else, that'll be very clear. And so I think the why is not necessarily something I can answer, but how you can analyze uh, one or the other is, is, is by examining your motives. If you are really going into a leadership experience or a connection with a supervisor or a connection with you know, a subordinate, then if you evaluate, hey, what do I want to get out of this? And if it's an opportunity to mentor someone, an opportunity to serve someone, an opportunity to make someone better, it's easier to make your say do gap match uh, or, or to not have a say do gap. But if I'm focused on solely making sure that I look good, then I will tell you whatever you want so that you'll make sure that I look good. And it, there's obviously going to be this disconnect. It's like, hey, Sean, you matter to me. You're the best radio host I've ever had the opportunity to work with, which is true. But if I wanted you to invite me back, then I would keep saying those things, regardless of whether it was true or not. But I want to make sure that people know you're amazing, good conversationalist, and, you know, a great host. So it absolutely makes for an easy opportunity for me to have, you know, a genuine conversation and connection with you about that. You're all too kind. So what I'm hearing is, is that <laughs> motivation is really, you said the word motivation. I think that's really key because then you kind of laid it out because that really comes down to integrity. So p telling people what they want to hear versus actually believing in what you're saying. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, when, when people are trying to connect with others, that genuine nature, that integrity, that who I am, what you see is what you get, thought process is going to go so much further. You know, I, I had the opportunity, responsibility to run for public office last cycle. And in shaking people's hands, sometimes people would say to me, Jennifer Ruth, I feel like you're so real. I feel like what you say is what you believe. Um, now, whether they believe that I was genuinely wrong, at least they believe that I was genuine. <laughs> and they believe that I believed it. And I wanted to connect with them. And so sometimes when people use the word politician, um, 
sometimes that has, you know, a negative bent to it because people feel like that automatically evokes this thought of transactional relationships. And so people aren't necessarily excited about what they, uh, what they think you are. Um, it's what they know you are. So they might think you're smart. They might think that you and walk away and think that you, you know, have great views and all those things. But if you, your life doesn't match, right, we have to have integrity in our office. We have to make sure that we serve the American people. And they find out that, you know, during a hurricane, you evacuate while everyone else has to stay behind because there's no hurricane evacuation for you. People are going to say, mm. do you really care about us? And so the thought process of being a politician and the integrity matching that that's a very big deal. And we see it across, you know, the spectrum of, of life, not just in leadership, um, but everything that we do, it matters. So, and that brings me to a point that you mentioned on your talking points. So what you do in moderation, people who follow you will do in excess. You mentioned that earlier before. Um, give us an example of what that means. Absolutely. So we, last time we talked about how kids will mimic everything that you say and everything that you do. And I think that, that anybody who's a parent understands that with great reality. But as a leader, if you believe that you could walk in five minutes late and because you're not accountable to anyone, that people won't see it or people won't respond to it, um, it's going to be very difficult when somebody walks in 20 minutes late and if you haven't said anything to the team, ah, oh, man, I'm sorry, I really had car troubles this morning. It was a really big issue for me. Sorry, I'm tardy, everyone and then you keep it moving, it's going to be very difficult for you to not seem like a hypocrite when someone shows up 30 minutes late because they had car troubles and you discipline them or you get on them. Um, and so I think it's important for us as leaders to think about the fact that I may do something in moderation, people are going to think it's okay in excess. I show up five minutes late, people are gonna show up 30 minutes late. And you say, why would you show up 30 minutes late? The question is, well, why are you a hypocrite? You show up five minutes, you show up late. Late is late. And so um, people don't have the same thought process. They just know that it's on or off. Late's okay. Late's not okay. Five minutes, 35 minutes. If, if one's okay, then the other's okay. So that's the concept I think I want people to walk away with, that you may say five, up to five to seven minutes late is okay. Like you have to set a standard, set a line. You have to abide by it because other people are going to, you know, give people an inch, they're going to take a mile. And that's kind of the thought process with that. How hard is it to be vulnerable when you're a leader? I think, mm, how difficult is it? I think that's an individual statement, but I can tell you that it is a heavily weighted uh, aspect of how people connect with you. Uh, when you are vulnerable, you show that you have flaws. And nobody can work and live alongside somebody that's perfect without <laughs> or that perceives that they're perfect. Because what, you know, I, I heard this, I'll give you this. I heard this, this thought process of integrity. Somebody said, what do you think is the best definition of integrity? And I said, well, I've traditionally heard that it's doing the right thing when nobody's looking. And so my colleague said, I think that's a great definition, but I would add something else to it to make it a little bit more complete. And he said, being willing to admit that you're wrong. Integrity is being willing to admit when you're wrong. And I said, oh, that's really interesting. Why would you say that? And he said, because if you cannot admit that you're wrong and other people know, then you're lying to yourself and you're lying to them. Mm -hmm. And that shows a lack of integrity. So the vulnerability to say, hey, this is a weak area for me. Hey, this is something that I need help with is such a big deal. I, I had a colleague who was vulnerable with, with his boss and um, he was a functioning alcoholic. And he had a very difficult situation where he and his wife were going through some struggles as a result of his functioning alcoholism. Nobody knew that he was, uh, had a drinking problem, but one day he and his wife had talked about it. It came to a head through a specific situation, and he said, I'm done. No more drinking. Mm. And he quit drinking 100% dry, and he went to his boss and said, hey, boss, i just letting you know this is a situation for me. This is my family situation. This is my personal situation. And I just, you know, want to let you know that that's where I am. Just as a courtesy to be vulnerable and to let someone know that that's what's happening in my life. Wow. And the boss said, hey, appreciate you letting me know. Thanks for that. 
But immediately that evening, he had already planned, the boss had already planned kind of a, a get-together for the entire unit, and he was a, a, a rum taster. So he had several bottles of rum that he loved to sample and that he brought for other people to sample. And so he had that conversation with his colleagues and then shortly thereafter sent out the invitation and said, hey, we're having a rum tasting tonight. I want to invite everybody to come. It's going to be a great time. We'd love to have you. And I think the more sensitive thing to do in the middle of that vulnerability would be to say, hey, this is an activity that I, res- that I have fun and I appreciate and enjoy. But perhaps let's save it for another time. That would have been the proper response as a leader. Mm -hmm. And so in giving this, you know, my friend giving a vulnerable, um, you know, statement and sentiment to his boss, now his boss has lost the opportunity for my friend to want to be vulnerable with him. And he's just erased any opportunity to want to connect. And it doesn't matter what the boss does. Uh, but vulnerability is difficult. And when you respond accordingly, or at least appropriately, then there's a clear opportunity to continue that. And when you are able to be vulnerable, you can build trust. And when you build trust, you build teams. And when you build teams, amazing things happen. Mm, I think that trust aspect is really important. But and then also, too, for me, I've always looked at the ability to be honest and as, uh, or ability to, to admit your mistakes as a, it's just a process of integrity, basically being honest. And I saw that as a strength for people. I never faulted anybody for admitting that they're wrong. And I actually see that as a strength of an individual because if you can admit that you're wrong, then you can get it right. But before you can get it right, you gotta know when you're wrong. Scientists, people that are researchers understand this and appreciate this the most because when they do in their work, they present it and it goes through trial periods and things like that. And that's the opportunity for people around them to find their mistakes. The best athletes, the best, best people in any, any endeavor, I, I love and, and appreciate criticism. I love criticism because then that helps me get better. I'm never gonna be mad if somebody criticizes me as long as it's a valid criticism. You know? Um, so I appreciate that, that um, what you brought up because I think it's so, so important, and particularly people in the military, um, to define the strength to be honest, especially when you are wrong, because then you do get the trust of your, of, your, um, of your subordinates. You do get the trust of people around you and your coworkers, and then also helps you get it right. You know? I agree. Wow. I think there's, there's this counter that that there's this this thought process that runs counter to vulnerability, which is ego. Mm -hmm. And so we've talked a lot about how leaders exist to serve and not be served. But if you have the wrong mindset and you are the one that has to be on a pedestal, has to be the one that everybody looks up to, has to be the one that can never at any point have any flaws, then that ego will run counter to vulnerability. And vulnerability may be admitting that you're wrong, but vulnerability may be admitting that you're weak and saying, you know, hey, I, I know we have our PT test coming up and I want to learn how to run faster or I'm barely meeting the times and I want to make sure that I can, you know, get some good practice laps in. Would you run with me? And it doesn't matter the rank. If you're capable of being a, a, a major and running with an airman and asking the airman to train you or the private to train you, like, that's great. And so it just shows that your ego is not as important as the reality of the team needing to be better. And you don't want to be the weak link. And admitting that you need help, like you said, is the first step to getting better. You know, Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, their first step is admitting that you have a problem. And I think it's a universal thing, but I think it counters the ego in so many ways. And in leadership, it's a very clear um, a very clear opposite sometimes from people that feel like they have to be somebody as opposed to being who they really are. You ever heard of a gentleman named David Goggins? No, I have not. I have he's not. A, he, was a, he's a, he was a U.S. Navy SEAL, and when he joined, when he joined the Navy, um, I think he failed like the, the, um, their, not their, their version of the, of the of boot camp or training, whatever you want to call it, um, for Navy SEAL training. He failed it like three times or something like that. And he, but he kept doing it over and over again, and he just would, it would, he just let himself be vulnerable. He's kept on putting himself in these bad situations. Somebody might, might say from the outside, but then he ended up being like one of the most feared Navy SEALs of like all time. This guy is <laughs> unstoppable. This guy is a beast. 
he's a beast. Sure. He has several books out right now. I think maybe one or two. I don't know. Um, and it's, you should check him out. David Goggins is his name. Nate, former Navy SEAL. He's got YouTube channels with him, Joe, uh, Joe Rogan and a bunch of places and things like that. Um, really, really interesting guy. Probably the most scariest man you will ever meet in your life. But I'm oh, man, him. I appreciate that recommendation. Yeah, David Goggins. Are you turning your vulnerabilities into strength? That is really, because that's what that, that's what you described is you, when you admit your, your faults and mistakes, and he always was a person who just owned up and his uh, faced his demons head on. He was that kid that was picked on and things like that when he was a kid, and then all of a sudden he grew up. Now he's just, he's the guy that scares people <laughs> when he walks into the room. <laughs> it's like, and you know, it's, 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 no, it's, it's I amazing. hear that. Yeah. So like, so when you you ran That's for funny. office, you ran for office in Indiana. So what did you learn from uh, your your experiences? What did that teach you about leadership, and also about uh, the, what did you learn from the process of running for office? And tell us about what you ran for and what you were doing. So I had the opportunity to run for Congress in Indiana's first congressional district. And we have a district of about 700,000 people. And it's an opportunity to meet people across two and a half counties. And depending obviously on the size of your district, you may have to travel you know, sometimes five, six hours. In fact, the entire state of Montana is one district. Uh, but here it's across two and a half counties. And so it is a, amazing place of cities that people may know are Gary and Hammond and Valparaiso and um, Crown Point, things like that. And so we have a pretty broad um, spectrum of just people with various backgrounds. We have urban uh, dwellers, we have farmers, we have people from all over. And so it's a very diverse um, group of people who are absolutely amazing. There's a huge spectrum on income. There's a huge spectrum on education. There's a huge spectrum as far as um, just activities and what we, you would say as far as, you know, a 180, a farmer to a, to a, a business person. And so, uh, but great people all around. And so it was my responsibility to connect with people, shake hands, help people understand the vision that I had for Northwest Indiana and provide them with uh, a clear intent and an honest effort to earn their vote. And so in thinking about leadership, you know, I, I, we're talking about books, and I just sent my first book to the Air Force to evaluate. The Department of Defense takes a look and says, hey, are there any security concerns? Are you giving away any trade craft or, you know, any of that? And so the first book is called People Don't Quit Their Jobs, They Quit Their Bosses. And uh, that's going to be coming out here in the next uh, couple months. And so I'm very excited about that. But the lessons learned from the campaign are largely reflected in that book. And these are some of the things that we talk about. So in my campaign, uh, there was an instance where political opposition took my, my personnel records. And in my personnel records, inappropriately placed, uh, is a record of uh, sexual assault that I experienced when I was uh, in Baghdad. And they took that and made it national news. And it was a very difficult time for me. Um, clearly, it was something that was very private. It was something that was very personal. It was not something that was public. Uh, and they decided to make it public. And it honestly put me into a huge tailspin. And it was very much a secondary assault. You live through the physical or you live through the emotional, mental, spiritual pains that you experience the first time. And when that occurred and it became public, um, it was, like I said, very difficult. But I, I felt like as many people as I had met, I had met tens of thousands of people, given hundreds of speeches across the previous 18 months, and I felt incredibly alone. Five people, five people of all the people that I had known and met across the entirety of my life reached out to me and said, hey, are you okay? And I think that was because, you know, in, in thinking about it later, reflecting on it later, connecting with my friends later, it was because they thought and assumed that somebody else was going to call. And they said, you're probably so busy or somebody else had already called or I figured your, your phone was going to be flooded. I feel like your inbox was going to be flooded. And so I just didn't want to bother you. Mm -hmm. And so I struggled with that. And I thought, you know, I, I had the opportunity. I'll preface the story with this. I had the opportunity uh, to reconcile and connect with some friends as a result of the difficulties that I experienced. But one of the difficulties I experienced was with my leadership. 
uh, my leadership knew about the situation. And I say this not to be um, difficult or to create any sort of victim ideology, but just to tell a real story. I hadn't been uh, at military drill for about seven or eight months. And when I came back in the drill, the first drill, the first thing they said to me was, all right, we've got to get your computer-based training knocked out, and then we've also got to get your weapons training knocked out. And so nobody had checked on me. Nobody knew my mental health. Nobody knew my mental state. Nobody knew, you know, the difficulties I was experiencing. But the first thing they wanted to do was put a loaded weapon in my hand. And I wasn't homicidal by any stretch. I wasn't suicidal. But nobody knew whether I was or not. And so the thought process that nobody was concerned enough about me as a person, but rather they were concerned about me as a, a cog, they didn't have compassion, they had a cog in the wheel that needed to get fixed, that to me showed a lack of leadership. Mm -hmm. Because if you cared about me as a person, then you would say, one, how are you doing? And two, before we do anything that involves anything dangerous or high risk, let me see how you're doing. Let's get the chaplain, the director of psychological health, your commander. Let's have that conversation. And so when I thought about that, I said, you know, I did have the opportunity to speak truth to power and speak to my leadership and say, you know, I, I, this hurt me. This was hard. I felt like I was a to-do list on a checklist or I was, a, 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 you know, an item on a checklist, an item on your to-do list. And I struggled with that. And then we had the opportunity, you know, to connect and say, hey, you know, bad decision. I'm sorry. Should have done it differently. And we are squared away. A-OK. -okay, everything's perfect. But then I sat down and I thought, what? How would I want to respond to a colleague of mine who had great traumatic difficulties? And how would I want to be responded to as, you know, from a leadership perspective? What would I want my bosses to do? What would I want them to say? And I would say, you know what? At the end of the day, I never want anybody to feel like they are an item on my checklist. I want them to know that they are valued. Because when I convey value, then they can trust me. And when they can trust me, we can build a team. Because a team is a group of people who trust one another. And a group of people who trust one another can do amazing things. And like we've talked about before, we have teams, groups of people who wear the same uniform, not a team, group of people who are motivated behind the same mission, not a team. We all see, you know, a basketball, you know, people wearing basketball jerseys that don't play well together. And you're like, man, you guys aren't a team. You're just yeah. out there, you know, doing one man shows or one woman shows. And so uniforms, a team does not make winning and having, you know, earning another win in the belt. Um, that does not a team make because everybody wants to win, but the trust is what makes the team environment. And so I didn't feel as if I could accurately, uh, I didn't feel as if I had accurately uh, heard that I was a trusted asset, that I was a valuable teammate. And those things were, were reflected in the lack of response to this particular large scale, difficult, devastating event. And so at the end of the day, the biggest thing that I learned was how do I want to lead? And these principles that we're talking about are a reflection of that thought process. So I asked, my quest, I asked myself the question, how would I want to convey value? How do I accurately convey value? And these are the things. Don't tell me you care about me, but not show me. Don't tell me you care about me, and then sign me up for weapons training after great trauma without any conversation in between. So that was a giant say do gap. But I will say that they were gracious, they were vulnerable, and they said, you know what, I'm sorry, I should have done better. And that was an amazing thing for me to be able to reconcile that. But that's kind of, you know, some of the things we talk about in the book, just being honest, me sharing my failures, sharing my successes, uh, both as a leader and a follower, and helping people to understand how to convey value. Because I never want somebody to feel like they're an item on my to-do list. Mm. When can we expect your book to be out? The book will be out in December of 2023. People don't quit their jobs, they quit their bosses. Wow. Become the leader others want to follow. Looking forward to it. you got to come back and talk about it when it's out. Absolutely. It'd be an honor. So we're wrapping up now. we got uh, about two seconds left as Glenn gets her microphone together. She's going to want to probably say a couple of things to you as well, I know. But like, once, what, what's, what would you say is 
your future within America's Heroes Group? Well, you know what? I am actively praying. America's Heroes Group does a great job, and they are on track to be syndicated, and I look forward to being a part of helping other people learn how to be more effective leaders. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Jennifer, you are simply the best. And I do not say that uh, without sincerity. I just really respect your your integrity, your intelligence, and your substance as a woman. And thank you for serving a country. And I always pray and say that hopefully we'll get an understanding that the country must serve you all as well. So thank you for being of excellence, Uh. sincerely. Praise God. As a we are so blessed sister, to have you as a partner. You what a great show. What a great show. Sincerely.